Today we got a good treat. Um, as most of you know, um, we now have a uh, international elective, an international opportunity for students to uh, go to Africa uh, on uh, an opportunity to provide medical care. And uh, Ann Craig and Dr. Fred Sullivan and a number of other uh, students and faculty uh, went to Kenya this year. And so we're going to hear uh, what that trip was like. So, yeah. So here's a little bit about um, our trip to Kenya. The group that goes every year is called SHIP. It's a very long name, that's why we call it SHIP. Um, support, supporting humanitarianism through international projects. Um, it was founded in 2009 by one of the uh, second year medical students who felt that there was a need to travel and get exposed to international medicine. Um, Amy and Matt Bernard. Um, and since then they teamed up with a small group in Kenya to um, just to kind of go and team up with them and do some rural clinics with them. So each year we go to, um, we go to this place in Kenya, we go to Bungoma, um, and the way it works is every person that goes has to raise their own money, so it's $2,000 a person, um, which is a bit expensive. They give you letters to help you write and send to your, to your parents and ask them for money and all of those people that you know that might be willing to give to you. Um, and then the rest of the money for the, um, and that, that 2000 pays for your airfare and then your housing. And then the rest of the money comes from, they do a big pre-med workshop, uh, which brings in most of their money, and then bake sales, and we do medication drives, and that helps pay for the medication that we bring over there. It also helps to pay for the new tires on the, on the vehicles that we go to, because the roads are really rough and they need to be replaced once a year, so we help fund those costs, and just like the general cost of being there. So that's SHIP, and we team up with Ecoday, which is, um, Ecoday is the, is the name of it whenever you're in the country, and then internationally they're known as Volunteer Kenya. Um, and this was set up by Bishop uh, Reuben Labonga and his wife, Betty. Um, he felt like there was a need for, to educate the people around, um, around his hometown. Um, he wanted to do, he wanted to provide education for them especially about AIDS and HIV. And so he said whenever he first start, started out, he didn't know the difference between HIV and AIDS. So he's, they've come a long way. Um, and the way they started out is they got a wheelbarrow and they borrowed a TV and a VCR. And they went to local groups and kind of gathered a crowd and they would play their video and just kind of let them know, you know, kind of educate them that HIV is an actual illness. It's not a curse from God. It's something that can be prevented with the proper treatments, uh, I mean, the, with the proper precautions. And so that was how Eco Day got started. And then <coughs> Volunteer Kenya kind of got started with uh, a college student named Hank Seek, I think is how you say his name. Um, he was from California. He decided to go to Kenya to work um, over in Kenya with some other organization doing some volunteer work. And whenever he got there, the organization had shut down. So he's in Kenya, doesn't have a lot of money, and wanted to volunteer and didn't really have any place to volunteer with. And so he met up with two women who were going to Eco Day to volunteer, and so they brought him along, and he fell in love with it. Um, and so they described themselves as a grassroots educational education and um, development work. And so he kind of helped with their with their vision and kind of helped get it off the ground. And whenever he came back to the states, he built them a website, which you can still go to volunteerkenya.org, and <coughs> kind of. Um, kind of helped bring them to be more more recognized and bring more people to help them educate. So, um, just so you know, here is Kenya's all the way to the right in the green, and there is uh, a map of Bungoma, so it's pretty close to Uganda. Um, I think they said it's about 30 kilometers. Um, and then you're close to Lake Victoria. And then you always hear about Somalia. Every time we were there, we had all of these things saying, you know, don't go to Somalia, there's lots of turmoil there. We'll, we're pretty far away from that, so that was okay. So that's what, And then um, Ebola was on this side. We're on that side, so <laughs> pretty far away, just so you know. Um, so here's their international airport, which we thought was hilarious. Um, no, there's not more to the right. It's That's their international airport in Kasumu. Um, and so the flight over there is pretty 
pretty long. Um, we've, flown, we've flown through Dubai, from Houston to Dubai, and then we've flown from Atlanta to Johannesburg to Nairobi. So either way, you're probably going to have very swollen ankles by the time you get there. Um, here is the whole group that we went with. This is our translators and um, some of the our drivers, Mama Betty. I don't know how to get the corner to work, so here's just everybody. Here's the farm where you stay. This is the place you call home. Um, each of these huts, they house four people. Um, this is Jim's. It's spelled James, but he says it's Jim's. Um, he helps out, and you'll see he's, I don't know if you can see it, but he's sweeping with branches, and he keeps the place looking immaculate. Um, here's the house, the main house that the family lives in that we stay with. We stay with Bishop Reuben and his wife, Miss, uh, Mama Betty. Um, and their whole family. So this is the house where they stay in and this is where you eat your meals and kind of socialize and they also have some bedrooms that they let us have if there's a big enough group that we need it. Um, so here's inside. Um, you notice that there's lights. Now this is Kenya, but there are lights. There's electricity, there's internet. Um, the lights are mostly from solar powers, so solar powered, and then they run the generator at night. And some of the money that we raise goes to fund the generator as well because we like our amenities. Um, and what's interesting about this is they like there's no telephone lines there's no there's no electrical power going to this house but they have solar powered and then they have cell phones so they kind of skipped over the whole landline thing there's no you know like we had a natural progression and they just skipped to the end so they have cell phones just like we do my husband got a text from Bishop Rupin the other day so kind of funny um, here was where the they used to, the family used to live in those little huts and we used to stay in those little huts, but before they built the big house, the big house was only built, uh, I think two years ago. And so this is the meeting hut where you used to meet and have all your meals. They would prepare the meals in the kitchen, which is very hot. And then you, they would bring them here and then you would eat there. This back shed uh, right here, is that's their generator shed. Um, and then to this, it's not showing up very well, but above, the, above this building to the, um, all the way to the left, there's a water tower kind of thing and that's where your running water comes from and they pay teenagers to pump it at the well and then they bring it and bring it on the roof and then dump it in this this <coughs> water tower so you have running water um, for the toilets and for the shower and your water is the same temperature as whatever is in the thing up there so it's kind of cold um, here's the water pump um, and so every morning you basically you get up and you pump your water um, and you filter, and you um, either filter it or puri purify it, however, whichever way you choose. So we did, I did the light filter, um, the UV filter, um, and you purify whatever you want for the day. Um, interestingly, Kenyans do not take drinks with their meals. Like they will never offer you a drink to eat with your meal, just because that's not what they do. And so if you want something to drink, you have to filter it and you have to bring it yourself. Even at a restaurant, you have to order it and you have to specifically ask for it. So they never provided anything to drink, which I just thought was odd. And so you, you pump your water, you filter it for the day, you know, that's what you brush your teeth with, that's what you use, and then we also pumped it and then filled up our solar showers, which you put in the sun, and then at the end of the day, you go and you hang it up, and you squat underneath it, and you get a hot shower, or a warmish shower. So that's how that worked. Um, so each morning, uh, we would get up and we would You'd filter, you'd filter your water, you'd do your solar shower, and then you'd eat breakfast. Breakfast was typically uh, bananas, PB&J, um, and chai tea. Um, they had a banana farm, so there was always fresh bananas, like really good fresh bananas. And sometimes they'd have papaya. Sometimes, if you're really lucky, they had hard rolled eggs. That was a good day. And then on very special occasions, you had nandazi, which was um, basically fried biscuits. That was a real good day. You are very happy. And then we'd have a lecture. Each of the students prepared a little PowerPoint, a little presentation on some form of tropical tropical medicine. Somebody bring Tony Sacheries to that table. Oh yes, we did. Oh, and the the family was like, "Can you leave some too?" Oh, and funny story about that. This is completely unrelated. Well, so we brought some for Bishop Rubin and Mama Betty, and we brought some for us. Well. My bags got lost for a couple days, and then Roger's bags got there. So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to wear his clothes. I'll find some scrubs. It'll be fine. His entire bat bottle of Tony Sasseries, the bottom came off of it. So all of his clothes 
everything in his again. We still have like chargers and stuff that you shake and Tony Sasseries comes out. It's so funny. So we didn't have any problems with mosquitoes though, I'm letting you know. Mosquitoes came nowhere near us. So just hazards of travel. You have to be flexible, I think is the main story. So here's one of the huts. Um, if you pay Jim's three dot three uh, basically three dollars, he will wash your clothes, hang them on the line and then return them to your room. So that was money very well spent. So that you don't have to come back home at the end of the day and pump your own water and then wash clothes and so, yeah, that was worth it. Um, so here's typically what your food looks like every single day, except for the chapati. You might not. Chapati was a good day. You had um, rice and lentils, cabbage and kale, or kale and rice and cabbage and lentils. Whichever, whichever combination you want, that's what you had every single day. Um, some days they had some beef and some days they had fish, but that wasn't, that wasn't typical. So, this was the uh, Nandazi, except this one's really big, this one's at a restaurant. I never did take a picture of the ones at the house, so fried bread, was so good. I'm like, you just need some powdered sugar on it and be like a beignet. So, pictures of Bungoma. Here's their booking office for travel railways and a crow. Um, Here's typically what the streets look like in the city. Um, they're very packed. Um, you take your life in your own hands when you cross the street. You gotta be careful. Um, these are mutatu. These are the vans that people um, would take. And if it wasn't filled over capacity, then it wasn't full. There was like basically no one in there. So they, they crammed in there. Um, and then that's why road accidents are high on the cause of mortality. Um, and then they also, I don't have a picture of a motorbike, but a lot of times they call them the pick picks and that's what they used to get, that was their taxi. So you pay a motorbike to bring you somewhere and they would fit as many people as they could on those motorbikes. Or, I mean, you can sit on the back of one of these bicycles too, but. Um, here's some of their markets. Um, and this lady right here on the blue um, table, is she's selling fresh fruit and so they had the best fruit. Um, you just had to make sure and wash it with your purified water or boil it. Um, so. A little about the mobile clinics. This is the clinic that was donated by Hank, the guy who kind of helped it go international. Uh, international. Um, his father, when he passed away, he wanted to donate towards this effort that Hank was very passionate about, so he donated money, and the um, Bishop Rubin and Mama Betty built this clinic. Um, and before, they've had people that they were able to be there all the time, and uh, a nurse around the clock, and the doctors coming in, but you know, it just depends on funding. So this is Mama Betty, I mean, uh, Mama Joyce. Mama Joyce works for the clinic and she's the one who kind of sets up all of our, she coordinates with the churches most of the time whenever our rural clinics are with churches that they will donate their building uh, for the day and let us go in there and, and use it. Um, and so she's the one who coordinated with all of those and set up all of the mobile clinics everywhere. And he, she's showing off her new blue scarf. Um, so here's the board every day as to um, where you're gonna be. Um, and you'll notice that they'll have um, Empower AIDS, AIDS Awareness, Nutrition, Men's Health, Women's Health. Um, so they do a lot more education. They do a lot of education. You can come and teach there. You can come and do mobile clinics and help educate on nutrition. I mean, they have a lot of things. They're very, whatever you want to do to help out, they will make it happen. Um, and so we were, of course, doing mobile clinics. So that's what we had set up. Um, so we went to the pharmacy. This is their pharmacy. Um, and you get whatever meds that you need. Um, it's not showing up, but there's a box of sterile gloves down there. So just out in the open. Um, and basically, it's kind of like other international pharmacies where you can buy anything over the counter that, that is not um, a controlled substance. Everything's over the counter except for those. So we bought all our antibiotics and malaria meds. What kind of, what kind of antibiotics were you able to get there? What's um, basically things we don't get? We were able to get a, whole, a lot of them. Um, we brought our own recepin. Um, and I have a list of all the, the ones that we had, but I think we had uh, Doxy, we had, um, what all did we have? Ampicillin. Well, an interesting combination that I saw was Ampicillin and Clotacillin. Yeah, Amplox. And the combination of medication that they used a lot of. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the uh, staff is not Ampicillin, but this is so interesting. <laughs> This was our pharmacy. Whenever you go to the mobile clinic, this had to be set up every time. Um, and this is Nancy and Putty. Um, Putty helped, he was our translator for pharmacy, and he was very eager to learn. 
he wanted to know why are you doing this what is you know teach me so it was it was really interesting um it was really fun to have him and you can always ask him like what is this medication and he's like oh this is tylenol you know like or something you know what it is it's just you don't know by that name so here's what one of the clinics look like um, they typically all kind of look like this and generally there's never enough chairs or tables and so you go in there and you say, I need another table. And it would come out of nowhere. Like they would go to their homes and bring tables on their heads and just, you know, whatever you ask for. If you asked for it, it was there like five minutes later. Um, they were so excited to have us there. So they, I mean, it was just incredible. We're like, where, are the, where should all this stuff go? Um, but in general, um, oops, um, they would come in and they would, uh, there would be a local Kenyan there to like, to register them, give them a piece of paper, give them a number, and then whenever their number was called, they would go to the next station. The stations were basically uh, one medical student or resident and uh, a translator, and they would translate for you. <clears throat> whenever you were done, you would record their history, physical, um, diagnosis, any tests that you did, and then what medications you wanted to give them, and they would take it to the pharmacy, and they would turn in their paper and get medications in exchange. And, um, we had these special bags where they can, they had like a, the suns on them, like the sun coming up, you know, that way you can say like up to four times a day. And so you would just mark like one when the sun comes up, one when the sun goes down, just to kind of make things a little bit easier um, for educating on how to take the medication. And then um, they do know what PRN means, so you could just write that. Um, this was one day whenever the other van broke down and we just waited because in Kenya time, it's just whenever you happen to get there. Everybody just kind of moseys on everywhere, so nobody's in a hurry. So the other van broke down, and we were like, well, we can go up, we can go start setting up, we can start doing things and like being proactive. And they were like, nah, just, nah, just wait, it's fine. No big deal. So, and we were definitely an event. They're all, like everybody just walked by the van and looking at you like, what are you doing here? Um, here's another one of the clinics. This clinic was actually very, very beautiful. I don't have a picture of, of the outside in here, but this one was kind of more in the mountains. This is where the Kenyan runners come from that run marathons because they were running up mountains like it was no, like it was nothing. Um, my husband went with them to go take a picture from the top of the mountain, and he was having to stop every, everyone. They were like looking at him like, what is wrong with these? Um, so it can be pretty crowded. Um, but in this area, actually, it was interesting that they didn't have a single case of malaria that we diagnosed on this day. And normally, you know, that's one of our top diagnoses is malaria. Uh, but they said because of the, the altitude that the mosquitoes couldn't get there. Um, and so you don't see a whole lot of ma ma malaria because of the altitude. Um, or they couldn't, not that they couldn't get there, but that's where they, that's not where those Anopheles mosquitoes lived. And so there's endemic areas down in the Rift Valley, but this was, um, this was not, so whenever, most people don't get malaria, but whenever there is an outbreak, and there generally will be, especially when there's a lot of rainy, when there's a really bad rainy season, whenever this area gets it, a lot of more people will die because they don't have the immunity that, that the people in the endemic area do. So it's kind of a, kind of a trade-off. Um, here's another one of the clinics. Um, so for our clinic, we had eight clinic days um, because we were only there for two weeks. Normally they go for a month. Um, and they're hoping to restart that. It was just a the Ebola thing, and it's just kind of an unusual year that we were only able to go for two weeks. Um, so there are eight clinic days. Um, we saw 652 patients. That's an average of 83 patients per day. So we stayed pretty busy. Um, average age of the patient, patient was 45 years old. Um, so a little older than I like. But um, we did see a fair amount of kids as well. Um, and we, we started t recording the number of patients who had their own uh, records. Um, basically, is what they do is they buy a notebook that costs about half of a penny or a penny for us. Um, and they, so it's very inexpensive, but they bring it to their doctor, and the doctor writes in there what, you know, what they've done, what their diagnosis is, and what treatments that they're getting. And it's a very, very short record. It's basically like if there's any pertinent findings, um, then they write that, but then most of the time it's just their plan. That's what they're writing down. Um, and so they'll bring that to you. A lot of them are illiterate and they're not, or they're not able to read English. And so they don't know what their records say. We had a child that came in and was having fits. Like he would have, and this was two years ago, he came in having fits and they didn't know, the parents had no idea what was wrong with him. And so they gave us his record and we said, oh, well, he's got sickle cell. This was, you know, he's in a pain crisis. 
And they said, what are you talking about? Our, sh our child does not have sickle cell because they, because that family said, they believe, or the translator told us that they believe that sickle cell is a curse. You know, because they were coming down with fits of pain and stuff. They used to think that they were possessed and that they were cursed by God. Um, so they didn't like, so the doctors a lot of times would not tell them you have sickle cell. Um, they're getting better about telling them more about about their diseases, but still there's a lot of times that they're treated and they're not told what is going on. It's a lot more paternalistic than ours. They don't discuss a whole lot. <coughs> so for us, the most common, here's the list of a lot of things that we saw. Uh, malaria is high up there. Allergies is pretty high up there. Lots of arthritis, lots of um, degenerative disc disease. Um, most of these, the, D the DJD was a lot of times in the women. Uh, the women will do the farming and the men will do the herding. And there was only one occasion where we saw an ox plowing a field. So it's the women that are bent over with these, I don't know, farm equipment stuff. I obviously would not make it in Kenya. Um, so they were plowing the fields themselves. And so by the time that they get older, they're you know complaining of back pain everywhere. And so a lot of times it's past the point where you can do anything. You can just give them some insects and um, I hope for the best. Here's the list of medications that we brought. So there's a lot of them on there. There's only, uh, we had one anti-malaria drug, the Croartin at the top. Um, we had some blood pressure medicines. Uh, there's a lot of, we, had, we treated a lot of infectious disease, but we're also, we also saw a lot more of the chronic diseases because as they're living longer, they're having more hypertension and more um, diabetes. Um, and trying to explain long-term diseases to a culture that's used to having a short-term illness. Normally it's you either die or you get better. Like you have an infectious disease, you die or you get better. Um, trying to explain hypertension where you feel fine, but you have something that might kill you in a couple of years. You know, it, it's hard to explain to them why they need their medication. They'll take it for the 30 days that you give them and then they will stop because everything else was for that time as well. So here's some of the other topical medications that we had. And we brought glasses and oh my goodness, we should have brought more. Um, everyone seemed like they needed the glasses. Uh, we didn't have any formal screening. Um, it was more mostly try this on, can you read this kind of thing. But um, that's something I think we definitely need to look into next year about um, providing more of. Um, here's our tests. So if you want any lab tests, pick one of these and that's what you have. Um, we did bring the nasopharyngeal endoscopy. Dr. Harper brought it. Um, you hook it up to a car battery. It kind of makes it look like an electrocution station. Um, but these people would, like if, because most of the time, the most common cancer in Kenya is esophageal cancer. They don't have a lot of cancer, but if you have one, it's probably gonna be esophageal. And so that's why, why he was going down to look for. Um, and these people, whenever you get this, they're going through your nose, and most of the time here, we'd make them NPO and have all of these preparations for it um, and our patients you know whine and complain and scream and I would too um, but they just sprayed some uh, some numbing stuff for their nose and like these people would sit up perfectly straight while a tube is going down their nose they're gagging they're throwing up sitting up straight and still thanking you for it like they do not complain at all they're so thankful to have these tests we even went to one of the local hospitals and he scoped two of their patients as well because their hospital didn't have the capacity to do this as well and he found two cancers there. One of them, he couldn't pass the scope through. And they asked how she had eaten, and she hadn't. Um, and they don't really have the capacity to do a peg tube for her either. So, very limited care. Um, so, going from what we're used to treating to what they're used to seeing is very different. So, here's the top 10, you know, for the middle class country up the middle and then there's to the lower income so most of them of these on the upper most of them are chronic illnesses except for the road injury and then um, like pneumonia but you know and then most of the ones for the lower class you know you're seeing a lot more infectious disease a lot more things that we prevent here um, like the malnutrition the uh, preterm uh, complications birth asphyxia um, but they are seeing more stroke now so that there are, we're seeing more chronic diseases in them, but it's still vastly, you know, you're looking a lot more at um, infectious causes. This was a study done in rural Kenya, rural Western Kenya, which I was so happy when I found, because what are the odds? It was done in 2003. 
um, and this was on kids done, uh, kids less than five years old. Um, and this is the most most common reasons that they were that they were seen. And you can see malaria top of the chart. Um, I'm not sure how how they tested if they tested each one of these um, because we've had problems with the translators asking, "Do you have fever?" You ask them, "Have you had any fever?" And they'll ask them, "Do you have malaria?" So for them, mal fever and malaria are one and the same. So a lot of times they'll call them that because especially when you're under five, you get it so frequently. And you're also seeing a lot of your URIs as well, so it's it's hard to distinguish between the two, if, especially if they're not testing. But you can see, you know, they're still getting a lot of viruses, just like we do here. Um, but they also do. You have to also keep in mind the diarrheal illnesses, the helmets, the pneumonia, and you know, vaccine pre preventable stuff as well. So here's some clinic patients. Um, here's a sweet little girl who came in. Um, I tested her for malaria and she was positive, so we treated her. She was very unhappy. You can see in this picture, she got a headband, a sucker, a toothbrush, and medicine, and she's still not happy with me. Um, but most of the time in, uh, with malaria, the, um, by the age of two years old, 100% of the kids in the endemic areas have had malaria. Um, about 85% of them survive. So you're sacrificing about 15% for those 85% to have immunity. Um, um, the strains that they saw there were mostly um, Plasmodium, uh, the ovale, uh, because they don't have the Duffy group, which you normally see is associated with the Vivax, uh, because they don't have that Duffy group on their blood type, then they would get ovale instead. Um, the ones that you worry about is the Plasmodium falciparum because it has a much higher uh, parasite load and so that they they can get sick a whole lot quicker because it replicates a whole lot more. Um, they said you can go from sim from symptoms to death within 48 hours. Um, and a lot of times if you're going to see the cerebral uh, malaria, which I didn't even know existed until we went here, um, then that's it's mostly going to be the falciparum that has it. And the uh, cerebral malaria was... The way that happens is you get the select, uh, selective adhesion of the parasitized cells to the vascular endothelium, and they get really sick. They have a lot of times have seizures, drowsiness, go into a coma, and they pass away pretty quickly. Um, and so that's most of the time. Whenever that happens, it's whenever the kids don't have a lot of immunity. So whenever they're under one to two years old, um, generally they're going to keep getting it until they turn about five years old, and then after five years old, they have a pretty good immunity for it. Whenever an adult comes in and they have malaria, they don't feel too bad. Um, you know, they actually kind of look better than whenever they have a common cold. Um, so this is in the endemic areas. And so this is the immunity that you would get uh, whenever you go down, whenever you go up into the mountains, that's whenever you're going to see the adults passing away from <coughs> malaria because they haven't had it before. Um, we use a lot of books. There's not a lot of electronic stuff and you have to charge electronics. So you bring books and you look up everything. Um, here's him doing one of the scopes next to the van. Um, lots and lots and lots of wound debridement. So anybody interested in surgery would be very happy, I guess. I didn't care for um, They're getting a lot more diabetes and they're having a lot more wounds that are typical like of diabetic feet and lots of stuff to clean. Um, here he's injecting her eyeball. I don't remember why. I just thought it was funny. Like, we injected eyeballs. She had an abscess and a lid. Oh. Okay. She had a lid. Oh. Okay. She the abscess. Yeah. Ouch. Um, a lot of times there's not exam tables. This was a really wiggly guy, and so I didn't want to put him on the really narrow pew, so you kind of do what you got to do to get your exam. But he was really cute. Um, anybody tell me what this is? He'd ever had, you know, I, the translator asked him if he'd ever had chicken pox, and I said, no. She, Mom goes, oh, that's what it is? I'm like, oh, okay, that's fine. And then I saw one on the brother's cheek, and I said, well, brother's about to get it, too, and she goes, okay. Took her towel and I was happy. So she was just happy it wasn't something bad. So this is jiggers, or sand fleas. They kind of burrow in, and you take 
a lot of times it takes a scalpel to go and cut them and get them out. I know it's nasty, I'm sorry. Um, you see a lot of this and basically it increases their chances of getting infections as well. So it really is called jiggers. Um, so this is one of the things that they, that they would show them, like it burrows in, it lays eggs, and then it spreads and stuff. Um, it was not, I mean, it, they can get pretty bad and basically just increases their risk of infection as well. So you have to go in there, clean them up, and then they don't wear good shoes. They wear flip-flops because the flip-flops cost 50 cents versus shoes cost $6. So why are you going to wear shoes that cost $6 when you can wear flip-flops? So trying to get them to wear shoes is troubling. Um, they aspirated a knee and got 60 cc's um, and she came back the next day and I think one of the other knee done as well. Um, Dr. Sullivan told me that there's flex cartilage in here so um, if you want procedures you definitely get them over there whatever you want. Uh, this has been doing some uh, skin, uh, skin lesions. Skin lesions. when everything cut off, everything done. Um, so we brought sterile kits and um, suturing things that you could use and then throw away. The surgery department helped us out creating some stuff for suturing. So we're very thankful for that. Um, there are some things that they wanted you to fix. They wanted us to fix this. Um, and then trying to tell them that there's nothing that we could do. We, you know, we can't do the surgery. We can't do anything for them. Um, we would write referrals to them to the local hospitals um, and you would basically your referral was you take an index card and you write on there this patient needs this and signed a physician an eco day physician um, this is a kid or an adult this is an adult um, and so it's just you know you do what you can and then you refer when you can um, and then we had one of the local physicians was working with us and she would if they were close enough to her she would see them and kind of get them through that system that way they wouldn't get lost to follow up. Uh, a lot of times money was the, the big factor here is being able to afford, they would have the services that they needed but they couldn't afford to pay for them. Or they would want something fixed, like we had a guy who was in congestive heart failure but he wanted his cataracts fixed and every dime he had was going to go pay for those cataracts. So. Um, there's no HIPAA laws in Kenya. <laughs> These kids, uh, we were apparently an event, so it was let's go down to the church because there's these crazy foreign people, and um, they would go and they knew what we had sweeties a lot of times, so they wanted sweets. Um, so they would just come and kind of stare at you and kind of wait and hang out. We did have private rooms where you could like we we set up a tarp where you can like go and do more intimate exams if you had to because everything was kind of out in the open and these kids were. Very sociable. And this, after you got your meds, you would go wait in the pharmacy line, and he was just waiting for me. Thought he was cool. And then after the clinics were done, we got to go and play with the kids. Um, they really liked bubbles. Um, trying to get them to understand like how to how to blow the bubbles, they just thought that was the funniest thing. Um, and we got to steal some babies. Um, this lady came and um, wanted to say thank you for all that we had done for her um, and the man next to her had helped set it up with the church. He, um, he kind of coordinated so she invited us over to her home in order to say thank you. Um, can y'all see that? Anyway, there's like a fire all the way to the right, and then there's big piles of clothes, and that's kind of what they slept on as well. And then pots and pans, and then they have like their their light up there next to the window. And so that's that was a typical hut. <coughs> and so after um, in between all of this, uh, we got to we got to tour one of the local schools, one of the, one of the schools that was set up by Eco Day. <coughs> Eco Day has a, they started out with a library that ended up being a school library because they wanted to help educate and pe teach people how to read. They have the clinic and then they also have a school that's uh, K through eighth grade right now. Um, and so we got to go tour their school and they all stood up and sang for us. It was really cute. Um, one group even sang, you are my sunshine. Um, every day, uh, every Friday they would get around the flagpole and they would sing songs. Um, just kind of part of their Friday. 
introduction to the morning. So that was always a fun time to kind of get to see them. Then we also got to tour the, wa the Waibuye District Hospital. Um, there's three buildings that are just like this. This hospital happens to have a family medicine residency program. Um, they're, trying to, they're trying to educate about the family medicine residency and the way the system works there, and I can't, I can't remember the names to distinguish it, but there's, if you go get some training, you have a classification, and then if you complete a full, like, like a full medical school, you get another title, and the names are very, very similar. I can't remember. Clinical which. officer is, is pretty much in the level of a physician's assistant, mm -hmm. or nurse practitioner. Yeah. And a medical officer yeah. has been to medical school and is in, uh, has done at least one year of postgraduate training. Uh, they call the uh, <coughs> residents uh, registrars. And so they normally don't, they normally stop after one year. And so they're trying to get them into doing three years of a residency type thing just for more education, for, um, to kind of expose them to more things as well. And so they also don't, are not really familiar with family medicine. Most of them, it's either you treat kids, you treat adults. They're not used to people doing, and then you have the people that deliver babies. Like it's just, you have your category and they're not used to somebody doing all of that as well. And so they're trying to educate from that standpoint as well. And do you remember his name? No, I didn't buy it. Uh, I forgot. There's a, a guy from the States over there, and he gave, he gave us a tour. He's the one who's heading that residency program. Do you know how much a doctor visit costs for those patients? Um, okay. Two cents. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is not, I guess, admission for emergency is free, non emergency is free. Um, so getting there is fine, it's just everything that you happen to have. And it's about 85 to 1 is the conversion rate. So, I mean, you can think of it like 500 is about $6. Um, yeah. And I like how they have the waiting times printed on them as well. Do they have to bring, um, one of my friends went to Kenya, deliver babies. <coughs> the moms had to bring the kit, the gauze, the blankets, and a plastic sheet and all that stuff. Do these patients ever have to bring their own stuff? Um, I didn't find out. So here's one of the wards that they're building. Here's pictures of what they're building. These are the different rooms, and each room houses like eight people. So when they when they gave us the tour, they said, okay, the back room, that's for all of the infectious patients. So if you've got malaria or HIV or TB, let's put them all together in the back room. But it's, you can see they're connected. Like they're not, they're not separated. And so... HIV with TB is one of the hardest things to treat, but right now that's just where they would go. And then like one room would be, like this side would be medicine and that side would be kind of surgical. And so like the medicine patients, short term, long term, and then infectious and then surgery, short term, long term, infectious. Um, a lot of the ortho patients were hooked up to traction. So you'd have a lot of people there for traction and just hanging out, relaxing. Um, so you can tell it can get it can get pretty crowded. Here, this is not a, as good of a picture, but this is another picture of where we went. Um, there's oxygen on the wall, so you have to be like in the, I think in the first room for the like acute patients to have the access <coughs> to the oxygen. Um, and here's their payment schedule. So. There was a similar schedule with. Um, lab test and they had a fairly extensive lab but it wasn't operating at the time because they didn't have any credentials. Yeah. They run out of stuff or something would get broke like it, a machine would be broken and they would have they would have a reagent but then the machine was broken and so like just getting a CBC at one point in time you're like maybe sometimes we have it sometimes we don't. Um, so you better really want your lab test. And the only radiography I mean the only lab test they had what radio they had chest X rays and and ultrasound. They do an awful lot with ultrasound mm -hmm. because it's the only imaging other than x rays that they have. And then their contrast study, I think they did bearing as well as. So just getting somebody, to, like getting Dr. Harper to scope somebody, you know, helps them 
you know, like because the, that mask was right in the center of her chest, and she, you know, they weren't able to really see really well, but he was able to tell them the extent of it. So. Now just pictures of animals, unless you have any more questions. So if, if you find a patient with a chronic disease, with a chronic diabetes or hypertension, what are the chances that they're going to be able to maintain their medication? Avenues where they can continue their antihypertensives or their or medication? They're not that the medicines are not in themselves that expensive, but getting them to understand the need for them. Like why am I gonna pay for something that could kill me in ten years versus put a new roof in my house? Like they have ability to um, they have eight medicines for HIV, like if you have HIV you have access to those, um, if they don't run out. Um, so you have them, but um, <coughs> that people don't want to go there because they don't want people to know that they have it. Um, so it's a huge stigma problem as well. Like one lady was, came to me and she was crying and I don't, I, I, there was nothing I could really do for her, but she just wanted to tell me, she wanted me to tell her that she didn't have HIV and she wanted me to tell her neighbors because her neighbors thought she had it. And she didn't, but she was being stigmatized. She's like, no one will pump water with me. No one will, you know, like no one will see me. I mean, I'm also that she's like, I don't even have it. And so, what we saw a lot of times is a lot of times the uh, the males will take more than one wife, and so like they might get it, but they will not tell their wives. And so whenever they pass away, their wives get inherited by someone else, and so they've given it to the wife, and they, you know, so it just kind of gets passed along everywhere. Um, and they might not have known he died from. He just passed away from some infectious illness, which is everyone else. So, trying to get them to understand, you know, glucose control. And we have to educate on salt restriction because they now have French fries. Like French fries have made it to Kenya. Um, and along with diabetes. And so, there's a lots of, you know, like trying to get them to restrict salt. You know, kind of those type of things. And you're you're having to do a lot more education that you're. When you're, you know, more along the lines that you're used to doing here. Um, so there's a lot more people that are overweight. Before it was like no one's overweight. But they're all still malnutrition. They all have malnutrition as well. Not all, but a lot of them do as well because the diet is so regimented, not a lot of variety. I think the diabetes and hypertension has to do more with westernized diet or with you now we're just living longer and we're kind of the problems that you know, I think so. And it's probably some of both. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about that. It's not to avoid it, but uh, it's not whatever. Um, it, it's not working very well because as they live past 45, many of them have hypertension and, and diabetes. and. Uh, it's hard to implement dietary changes when their diet is so restricted to begin with. So um, it's, a, it's a difficult problem. There is medication available, and it's not very expensive, but uh, convincing them that they need to take medicine long term is really uh, a, a difficult cultural problem. And I must commend all of you for the efforts you all have made. Mm -hmm. uh, from my experience in the global health and international pediatric, I would have a few suggestions and a few questions. Sure. As you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a separate, very well-funded international branch. And major medical schools here work with medical schools in different countries. And there are some from Kenya who are great, and I know the and the neonatology, and we have some top neonatologists who are trained from uh, Harvard, and there are a lot of public health people like the Hopkins Public Health uh, from Bloomberg Med School, uh, the one from Harvard. A lot of these guys, and I'm sure Dr. Venture uh, is here, will tell you that Baylor's got a very strong program, not necessarily in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So the exchange of faculty, the exchange of fellows, that's, so in other words, you have to set up the system. That's number one comment. The second comment is that, as you know, in the global health, uh, from the Millennium Development Goal, all developing countries have to meet certain criteria for the 
International Monetary Fund to get funding and they hold them accountable. So it will be nice to sit down the road to work with the government because they hold them accountable. When they give them money, they want results. Are you decreasing uh, maternal mortality? Are you decreasing infant mortality? Are you decreasing adult lifespan of adults, uh, health disease prevention? So they look at all those factors. Again, the data may not be as good. Uh, clearly, you started off very well saying that nutrition and prevention is the key. I would add one more thing to that uh, from our studies and many of the single thing that makes a difference is you educate women and young girls and you empower them. It's easier said than done because there are cultural barriers and time barriers to it, but that makes a lot of difference. Uh, again, from the system I've said to set up the medical school and you know, because remember the government, what you showed, the district hospital, that's completely different than the med school. They're two separate branches of the government. And this public-private partnership or the NGOs that you're talking about going to churches, so that's good. But you have to look at what's, what's our goal and how we're going to reach there in five years and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's something you want to keep in the back of your mind. Now the questions are, number one, did you guys take malaria prophylaxis because there's a lot of uh, drug-resistant falciform or vivax malaria down there? Absolutely. Yes, okay. sir. Uh, CDC guidelines. Okay. Uh, and uh, do they have a lot of drug resistance? Did you see that uh, in terms of malaria? Because that um, is a major cause. It is a major cause. We used what the locals, um, what the local doctors have been recommending, um, because there is a lot of resistance. We use coart coartum, which is two medications <coughs> in one, and they they've found that those have been working pretty well so far for the current being current time. Okay, and uh, the other thing, you know. In terms of uh, in terms of the healthcare system of delivery, maternal nutrition delivery, uh, do you have any idea uh, data on that? Because you know, I noticed in one of your slides uh, where you give different diseases, diabetes was conspicuously absent, and if you believe in the Barker's hypothesis, that is the major cause. Is if you have growth retarded fetuses or SGA you're setting the uh, setting the stage up for subsequent diabetes. That's why that's very high in most developing countries. Was that an error? Because your data collection rate was very low. I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. You see, you had a slide where you gave different diseases that you encountered. I, in that slide, I did not even see diabetes. I, uh, Fred said that after 40, you see diabetes. We have we didn't record. Was a disconnect uh, to me because diabetes is a major. A lot of times the people did not acknowledge that they had diabetes, and so if you asked them if you, if they had anything, they would say no. We we tested the people that had. Uh, we did the glucometer test on the people that had um, non-healing wounds on their legs, and we would test them for their sugars. And a lot of times we'd find out, do you have diabetes? And you'd ask them again, and you say, well, your sugar's 300. Do you have diabetes? And they'd go, oh, I was supposed to take some medicine. Um, so it's just education as far as that goes. So a lot of times we wouldn't get that information from them, and we didn't test every person. We only tested the people that we thought were high risk for, um, for having diabetes. So that was not one of the common diagnoses that we had, but it is, we were seeing it. Does that make sense? And what about preventive measures of waterborne? And, uh, you know, you showed some pictures of Huts. Are there a lot of families and kids because you know, if you have TB or other uh, lung bone diseases, it will be transmitted to the to the to the uh, other members of that family, if you will. Yeah. And certainly, hand washing is a major cause of uh, waterborne illnesses. Uh, there, so both airborne and waterborne illnesses are a major issues in terms of prevention and education. Yes, um, water purification is a, is a big big problem there as well that's what you know they there's a lot of work being done on that um, the farm where we stayed with mama Betty and Bishop Rubin um, there's people would come from very far to come and use their pump because they had a good water pump and they had clean water a lot of people don't have that luxury and would go to the local streams and so that I mean that's why diarrheal illnesses is a very common cause for morbidity and mortality thank you
Good job. I want to thank you. I think this gives us a really good um, idea of what kind of experience you could have and <clears throat> what you can do uh, on a short time basis to uh, to get some good inter uh, experience in international health and understand the local country community and, and uh, I think it's great. So thank you.